Gentlemen, I call to order this October 28, 2015 <coughs> public hearing to consider two separate application requests. Before we begin, please join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. At this hearing, we will continue. We'll continue. I'll start it off real good. We are considering an application by John Brosey on behalf of Gobi Walnut and Western Hardwoods, affecting property commonly known as 25408 South Highway 99E, Aurora, Oregon. The application before us consists of two separate requests. And by the way, we're going to get into where this location is. But if anybody knows where the Top of Hill Restaurant is, it's close by. Number one, a post acknowledgement plan amendment of the Clackamas County Comprehensive Plan to redesignate the subject property from agriculture to rural industrial, ZO 294 15 CP, and two, a corresponding zoning map amendment from exclusive farm use, EFU, to rural industrial, ZO 295 15 ZAP. The hearing today will proceed as follows. We will first hear the staff presentation from senior planner Martha Fritzi. Next, the applicant will have up to 20 minutes to present. After that, I will open the hearing for public testimony, beginning with public officials who will have five minutes each. Then, representatives from recognized community planning organizations and agencies will have three minutes each. And finally, other people wishing to testify will have three minutes each. And finally, the board will then deliberate and either render a decision today or set a time to make a decision at a later date. Assisting us in the hearing today is our clerk, Kevin Moss, and Assistant County Counsel, Nate Boderman. If you, um, if you wish to testify, please complete one of the green cards, and I believe they're right outside the door, or Kevin has some here, and give it to Kevin Moss. If you have prepared a written statement, please give a copy to Kevin and use your time to summarize what you have written. Everyone who wishes to speak will have an opportunity to do so. There's such a throng out there, yeah. Not, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people. I'll have to gavel somebody here, I guess. We will now begin the hearing uh, with a legal statement by Nate Boderman, Assistant County Counsel, followed by a staff report by Martha Fritzi, Senior Planner. Good morning, Commissioners. Thank you. Now is the time we have set for public hearing for the applications identified as Z0294-15-CP and Z0295-15-ZAP. This is a quasi-judicial land use hearing, which requires that we make certain declarations before we begin. First, all the criteria that can be used in reaching a decision have been identified in the staff report. Testimony, arguments, and evidence must be directed towards the criteria identified in that staff report or other relevant criteria found in the comprehensive plan or other land use regulations that the person believes applies to the decision. Second, failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude appeal to the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals on that issue. Failure of the applicant to raise a constitutional or other issue relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government or its designee to respond to the issue precludes an action for damages in circuit court. Once final, this decision may be appealed to the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals. And at this time, I'll ask any of the Board of Commissioners to disclose any ex parte contacts, bias, or conflicts of interest. Commissioners? Nope. 
No. Nope. None. Nope. Martha? None. Yeah. Vile Seeing none, if anyone wishes to challenge the impartiality of any commissioner, please indicate your intention to do so in any written or oral testimony you may provide. Now we'll hear from uh, Martha Fritzy. Good morning. Well, the proposal in front of you, um, as stated, is a proposed comprehensive plan designation amendment from agricultural, uh, from agriculture to rural industrial, and a proposed zone change from exclusive farm use to rural industrial for a portion of um, about five and a quarter acres of a 20 acre parcel. Because this is a proposed change from an agricultural designation, it requires a goal exception. Um, this, the proposal in front of you is for a reasons exception. The business that wants to move onto the site um, processes salvaged wood and trees into products that will be sold on a di in a different location for uses such as furniture making, flooring, um, furniture, um, other woodworking projects, gun stocks. The site, the general location of the site is identified on this map. It's along Highway 99E um, between Aurora and Barlow and Canby. It's the old Top of Hill RV sales and service site, um, very close to the Top of Hill restaurant and the Grange. It's on the south side of the highway. What happened? Oh. <laughs> Um, approximately five and a quarter acres were proposed for the rural industrial zoning. You can see it outlined on this map here. It contains um, over 9,000, 9,500 square feet of building space, a fenced area, um, extensive gravel and asphalt surfaces. You can see the balance of the tax lot, where it says balance of tax lot 800, that's roughly uh, 15 acres. There's a natural break along the trees right there. It's a very steep slope. The bottom portion, which is identified as the balance of tax lot 800, would remain um, under the EFU zoning. So I'm gonna draw your attention before we move on um, to some new exhibits that were provided after the Planning Commission hearing and prior to this hearing. Exhibit seven was in your packet, and the, it's significant because if you notice on the previous slide, there appears to be a property line encroachment um, or building encroachment on the property lines. The proposed um, owner of this site and the owner of the small site, can I point? Mm -hmm. Of this, this little site up here are proposing to move this line to, to get rid of um, this encroachment issue, and it would require a property line adjustment, which would occur um, after this is approved, if it is approved. The proposed line that both the um, Gobi and the owner of this site have agreed to is roughly along here. And if this is approved, the rural industrial zoning district, or the rural industrial change would need to follow this line rather than the old line that was proposed that goes through these buildings. It's not a really big issue, but it's just something to be aware of. Now, in addition to that exhibit, you'll find exhibits eight and exhibits nine on your desk. Those were received um, after I had already sent you the packet. And they are both some additional information from the applicants relating to uh, noise data from the sawmills and some additional analysis that addresses one of the criteria that hadn't been addressed and I'll talk about those a little bit later in the presentation. After the property line adjustment, this is just a rough estimate of the air or a rough drawing that I did um, of what the area would look like that would become rural industrial. In the red. In the red, yes. <coughs> So moving forward, and I'm going to probably plow through this pretty quickly since we don't have an audience today. Um, so if there's any, if I'm going too fast or if there's any questions, feel free to slow me down. Um, as we stated, this requires a goal exception because it's a change from agriculture to rural industrial. Um, goal exceptions are required under state law. 
There are three types of possible goal exceptions that you could apply for, physically developed exception, the irrevocably committed exception, and the reasons exception. As I stated earlier, this falls under the reasons exception. The, the reason that this falls under a reasons exception is um, that or originally the applicants applied for a physically developed and irrevocably a reg, a committed exception. And <laughs> I have a hard time with that word. Um, you can see a large portion of the property has been developed and, and it probably would have been a very good candidate for this type of exception, except that during that process we received um, a determination from LUBA which was upheld in the Court of Appeals that changed the interpretation that we have to give to a portion of the administrative rules. And what it did is it really tied our hands a little bit. Um, if we were to approve it under a physically developed exception, we would have had to limit the uses on the property to the uses that existed. And it's problematic, one, because the uses that Gobi is proposing are not the same um, as previously existed on the property. And quite frankly, there's nothing existing on the property right now except for buildings. So because of that, um, we met with the applicants and gave them two options. One is to wait um, for the resolution of the appeal, which unfortunately was resolved and the interpretation was the same. Um, or, and then to wait for rulemaking, which is gonna be happening this fall and winter that will address that specific administrative rule and we are hoping we'll change it back to the old interpretation that we used to um, have for this rule which makes a lot more logical sense under the physically developed um, exceptions. That was the first option requiring a fair amount of time certainly and the second option was to come back and apply for a reasons exception. Um, obviously that was the route that the applicants chose to take, so we're looking at this now as a reasons exception. The relevant criteria and policies for reasons exception are listed up here. There are quite a few of them. Um, the main bulk of the uh, criteria that need to be met really are the under state law, the administrative rules, um, and the statutes. There are certainly comprehensive uh, county comprehensive plan policies that need to be met and uh, ZDO policies that need to be met. Section 1202 uh, relating to zone changes is largely, largely procedural, but they still need to be addressed. So I am going to go through the criteria. Uh, the reasons exception process under the administrative rules requires you to address these four larger criteria. The need, the applicant must identify that there's a sufficient reason um, that this, the proposed uses need to locate in the, on the particular site that there's something unique about the proposed business and the particular site that there is a need to have it locate there. Um, the alternatives analysis, the applicant needs to demonstrate that areas that don't require a new exception cannot reasonably accommodate the use. Consequences, um, the proposed use, they, uh, the applicants need to demonstrate that the proposed use will have minimal adverse consequences compared to other locations, and the other locations are other locations that would require a goal exception, so in other words, other agricultural land. And the compatibility argument, um, you need to demonstrate that the proposed use must be compatible with other adjacent uses or be so rendered through measures designed to reduce adverse impacts. And the important thing to keep in mind with that last one is that it doesn't, it doesn't say that, actually the last two, that you have to demonstrate there are no consequences or um, that um, if it's incompatible, you can demonstrate that there's a way to make it compatible. It's not an absolute. So under the first criteria, um, the administrative rules provide a lot of direction and they provide some specific direction for rural industrial uses and they provide some specific uh, reasons that you can use to demonstrate the need under this criteria. So the applicant's proposal falls under um, item C, the use would have a significant comparative advantage due to its location which would benefit the county economy and cause only minimal loss of productive resource lands. 
So in other words, there's some, there, it needs to demonstrate that there are some special features or qualities that necessitate its location on, on or near this proposed site. The applicant provided, um, whoops, I skipped right over one. The applicant uh, provided some information uh, and some findings related to this. They generally um, address the comparative advantage and the specific transportation advantages. Um, the business that, the portion of the business that Gobi Walnut is proposing to move to this site is the two electric sawmills, a drying kiln, and then they're used, they want to use the large fenced area for drying wood. And currently, if my understanding is correct, those operations are located on two separate sites uh, that are in north or northwest Portland and one site even out in Port of St. Helens, which is near or in Scapoose. They want to consolidate from those two locations down to this larger location. The argument is that, um, the argument related to the transportation advantage is that this central limit Willamette Valley location is closer to a lot of their suppliers and some of their employees and that they need the space that this property affords to be able to, to consolidate their operations, to be more efficient, um, and be only on one site. And so, despite those arguments, um, staff found, finds that the applicant still hasn't demonstrated a really compelling reason that there's something so unique about both this business and the location that it must locate in this, on this particular site. Um, I understand that it probably is advantageous for them to locate in the central Lambert Valley given um, a list of where their suppliers are. And it certainly is, would be advantageous to locate on a larger site, but I guess where, the argument is a little tenuous is that there isn't really a demonstration about why this particular site is the one that it has to locate on. Those general arguments, it seems, could apply to a lot of other sites in the general vicinity. So that was the first criteria. The second criteria is the alternatives analysis. State law prescribes that you don't need, necessarily need to address specific sites, it's, rather, it's areas in the vicinity, and the, the key is the phrase, it cannot reasonably accommodate the uses. And reasonably accommodate has been defined by LUBA, and, well, I guess been addressed, I don't know if it's necessarily a definition, and essentially LUBA has stated that the reasonably accommodate criteria is difficult to meet because you have to demonstrate that um, all of these other sites, th that even if there's another site that you prefer not to use or wouldn't be ideal, that there's some reason that this business could not go there. It's not, it, just because you want to locate on one site as opposed to the other is not a sufficient reason um, under the reasonably accommodate standard. And the rules set out three areas that need to be addressed in the alternatives uh, sites analysis. The first is why this business couldn't locate inside an urban growth boundary um, on, a, on an alternative site or area inside an urban growth boundary. The second is why it couldn't locate outside an urban growth boundary in an area that would not require a goal exception. In this case, that would be another rural industrial, industrial parcel. And the final one is natural resource areas that are already committed, including in an unincorporated community. Um, with regard to the last area, there, was no there were no findings and no information related to um, an alternative analysis of those sites. The analysis that was provided addressed properties both inside and outside of urban growth boundaries. Um, that would not require a goal exception. And the inside the urban growth boundary arguments um, are a little difficult, although um, the, you, are, you are allowed to use economic arguments when you are addressing these alternative sites. And so, so on the face of things, it was, a really, it was really difficult to take the leap from there's a business that's currently located inside an urban growth boundary and 
seemingly successfully operating inside an urban growth boundary, it's, it's very difficult to make the argument that it cannot locate an ins inside an urban growth boundary. And so the analysis really comes down to the urban growth boundaries that are nearby, um, the first one being Aurora, which is very, it's a very small city and they have a very small industrial area. Um, I drove down there, it's really, there, there's nothing that would be appropriate for, for, the, for this business. Um, and then you need to look at Wilsonville and Canby, and you know, Canby has a very large industrial area inside the urban growth boundary um, with a lot of available sites and a lot of available land. So um, at the Planning Commission hearing, we heard from the applicants who, who um, will probably speak to you today about the fact that locating inside of an urban growth boundary um, is prohibitively expensive because there's not a need to pay, pay for land that is already served with, with utilities because they don't need um, the utilities and their proposed business is not very labor intensive. Um, and so whether or not it's prohibitively expensive, I'm not absolutely certain, um, but that, would cert that can certainly be a valid argument to not locate it inside an urban growth boundary. The other area that it needs to be looked at under the alternatives analysis is the rural industrial areas. And there is a fairly sizable rural industrial area just west of Canby, along Highway 99E, and then just outside of Barlow. It's based on information provided by the applicants, um, there, is no available, there are no available sites in these rural industrial areas. Um, the rural industrial area that's located just outside of Canby is very large, but a large portion of it is taken up with a, um, a surface mining operation. Um, I'd say over half of it. So um, there are no sites available according to a windshield survey that was done by the applicants. Um, staff finds that some of the additional information that was provided related to alternative sites inside the urban growth boundary was helpful, um, particularly information relating to Wilsonville, because Wilsonville does have some prohibitions on things like outside storage in some of their industrial areas, which clearly would not work for the proposed business. Um, but the staff still finds that the applicants really have failed to demonstrate with the evidence that they've provided why their business couldn't locate in a different location inside an urban growth boundary. And the third, the third area in this un listed under this criteria um, hasn't been addressed at all. So, oh dear, so that criteria hasn't been met either. The third one under consequences requires that you provide um, an economic, social, environment, um, economic, social, <laughs> and energy and, and uh, consequences analysis, an easy analysis, um, and it's it's to demonstrate that adverse impacts of the proposed use are no greater than if the uses were to locate on another site requiring a goal exception. Um, until yesterday, this analysis hadn't been provided. It was provided yesterday afternoon. Um, it's included as Exhibit 9, which was on your desk when you sat down. The, in this case, the analysis really is fairly easy because the site is largely developed, at least the portion of the, um, of the site that's proposed for the rural industrial zone. Um, because it's largely developed, it, it becomes a pretty easy argument to demonstrate that the impacts to locate on another site that would require a goal exception, in other words, another agricultural site, would most likely be higher because this site was long ago taken out of agricultural production and the impacts of locating on this site are actually fairly low. So this analysis was provided yesterday, um, so the slide is not correct. The um, staff finds that it, this this criteria could easily be met with, um, with the analysis that was provided by the applicants. And then the final criteria under the reasons exception is that the proposed uses must be compatible with other adjacent uses or so rendered through measures um, designed to reduce adverse impacts. Uh, we find there's no reason to believe that it, that it would not be compatible. The previous business that was there 
was um, an RV service and sales business. There, if you noticed on that um, first aerial photo, there were a lot of vehicles and all sorts of things on the property. None of this precluded the neighboring properties from um, farming if they wanted to. There's actually a pretty big warehouser nursery operation immediately south or southwest of the property. So locating this business on the property, we don't feel is likely to be incompatible with any of the neighboring properties and preclude them from um, being able to perform any of their agricultural operations. There was some concern at the Planning Commission hearing about the noise from the sawmills. There was some question about whether or not it would impact neighboring homes. The Planning Commission asked that the applicants provide some additional noise um, information, some noise study. That is found in Exhibit 8. Um, that was on the desk in front of you, and I'm going to um, ask the applicants if they would just address it really quickly, because I'm not certain I understand what the data means, but it appears to me that um, the noise that is come, emitted from these electric sawmills is not going to be extraordinarily high or, in, or negatively impact the neighboring homes that are about 200 feet away. So I don't think that that's going to be an issue, but that was something that came up at the Planning Commission hearing um, that there was a little bit of concern about. So staff feels that the compatibility criteria can be met, or it has been met. So moving along, this proposal also needs to meet, um, be consistent with the statewide planning goals. And since the goal exception requirements are not met, this application is found to be inconsistent with statewide planning goals two and three. Um, statewide planning goal two is land use and three is agriculture, which are the two um, that we're directly addressing by the reasons exception. Um, they also need to address goal 12, the transportation planning rule, because this is a zone change. There was a traffic study done and ODOT reviewed it. The Highway 99E is ODOT's road. Uh, the study found there would be no significant impact by um, locating this business here, and so it is consistent with Goal 12. And incidentally, ODOT had no objection to this um, business. Moving on to the county's comprehensive plan policies, um, the policies that apply to this application would be found in Chapter 4, Land Use, and Chapter 5, Transportation. Um, under Chapter 4, we look at the rural industrial policies. The comprehensive plan um, tells us areas that we can apply rural industrial zones, and a rural industrial plan designation, and then the subsequent zone. And the applicable policies are listed up here. The first one, it may be applied in non-urban areas to provide for industrial uses that are not labor intensive and consi consistent with the rural character. Um, I think that's pretty obvious. They're proposing three or four employees for this five-acre site. Um, it's a you know wood processing um, business that is consistent with the rural character of the area. Um, number two just says we will apply the rural industrial zone, which is what the proposal is for. And then the third one, areas maybe it, it tells us which areas we can designate as rural industrial. There's three options. The first two obviously don't apply. It's not in an unincorporated community. This is not an abandoned mill site. And so we have to go to sites with an historical commitment to industrial uses. Um, in this instance, it's pretty clear that this site, this, this portion of the site, the five acre portion of this site, has um, a commitment to an industrial use. Near as we can tell, it's been in an industrial use or industrial type use since about 1947. There, we verified non-conforming uses and have done alterations and modifications um, in the planning department for welding, metal, metal fabrication, light and heavy mechanic operations, and then some incidental sales, the RV sales. So this criteria is very, very clearly met. And then finally, going on to our zoning and development ordinance, um, I mentioned we need to look at section 1202, the zone change criteria. These, these are really largely procedural and again, goes back to um, meeting the transportation planning rule, which there was no identified significant impact and so it does meet that rule. 
Sections 401 and 604 um, EFU and rural industrial don't contain any approval criteria, but it's important to keep in mind that all of the other development standards under rural industrial would need to be um, met and any other applicable regulations would need to be met by um, when any develop when any additional development would happen on this property. So uh, I mentioned the planning commission hearing. We had that a month ago. The major issues that were discussed at that hearing were the noise from the <coughs> sawmills, um, the fact that at the time there was no easy analysis, look it's listed up there for me, and um, there was some talk about whether or not this was the right exception, um, goal exception type for this property, which at this point in time, it, the reasons exception really is the only option for them to take on this property. There was no public or agency testimony at the public hearing. And the Planning Commission recommended, unanim unanimously voted to recommend approval. Um, subject to the applicants providing the additional analysis um, related to noise and the easy analysis, both of those have now been provided. So this slide also is wrong. Staff's recommendation, however, is denial of this application um, based on the fact that the evidence and findings provided by the applicants, um, staff finds really don't meet the criteria for the reasons exception, um, specifically the need criteria and the alternatives analysis criteria. The consequences um, was listed up there just because at the time the information hadn't been provided. You, could t you can probably cross that one off the list at this point. So it really be, it's really the need and the alternatives analysis criteria um, that are not met. And so staff's recommendation still is for denial of this application. And that is the end of my presentation. Mr. Smith. So talk to me about um, goal two and three, and you say they, they do not meet the reasons exception. Uh, and that's why I'm sorry, maybe I stated that backwards. All right. So goals two and three are not met because the reasons exception criteria is not met. If the reasons exception criteria were met, then goals two and three would can, be. Can you explain to me goals two and three, and then explain how they did not meet the criteria? The criteria for the reasons exception are under the statewide planning goals. Goals two and three. What's the basis so, for your denial, I guess, so is what I'm asking. The basis for my denial is that the application doesn't meet the criteria for the reasons exception. So goal two um, is the goal that requires the reasons exception to happen for the zone change to happen. And so if it doesn't meet the criteria for the exception, it therefore doesn't comply with that goal. There's not. There's not criteria in the statewide planning goals they ha that specifically have to be addressed. It's whether or not they comply with. And goal three? And goal three is agriculture. Um, and the uses proposed on the property are, are not goal three. I mean, do not meet the criteria for goal or. <laughs> and so I understand. OK, I'm going to follow up. <clears throat> mm -hmm. John Brosey submitted what he considered to be adequate uh, support in the reasons exception, but you reviewed this new document and determined that it was not. The new document being Exhibit 9? Yes. Not, not, the, not the noise, but... No, no, I, 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 I pulled that one off of my list, and so I think that I, I think that, that criteria under consequences um, can be met. Okay. So, so explain to me why then he did not meet the reasons exception. So there's four criteria for the reasons exception. There's need, alternative sites analysis, the consequences, and compatibility. So you have to meet all four of those criteria. And which did he meet? The first two. Uh, alternative need sites and, and alternative needs. sites. The third one can now be met with the additional information that's provided in Exhibit 9. Uh, I'll wait and listen to the applicant before I make comments. All right. Okay. Any further questions or clarification, Commissioners? Yeah. Commissioner Schrader? So, um, 
This whole reasons piece, though, has recently changed because of a LUBA and a Court of Appeals issue. But prior to that change, they would have met the criteria? Prior to that change, um, this would likely have been approvable under a physically developed exception. Um, because of the LUBA decision, we have to interpret the criteria in such a way that limits us to, um, if we approve a physically developed exception, uh, we have to limit the uses to what's existing on the property. Prior to that, our interpretation was we had a choice and we didn't have to do that. Okay, that, that and this has been very, very, very recent within the last month? Yes, uh, no, within the last year, I believe year or so. it was. Okay. It came about because basically what we did with Hal's uh, it went yes. down and, mm -hmm. and so now, uh, and we understand that Mr. McAllister and others are working to, uh, to reinvent the, um, the ability to give a physically developed exception in, the, in these cases. Yes. But for currently, right now, we have to exist under the rules that have been laid down or reinterpreted by Salem. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll proceed with that. Commissioners, any further questions? Yeah, I have a question. Commissioner so, Savas? I have a question for Nate. Nate, um, as far as this topic right here and the recent interpretation, um, how much standing does that have? I mean, for example, let's say that, you know, another county or our county um, were to approve it without meeting that reason's exception. Um, does that have standing or is it really the, still the ruling stands all by, I mean, how much standing does that ruling have um, because of the house paving? Sure, so the, uh, we, we have to talk about separate processes here because what the, the house ruling affected was really the irrevocably committed um, exception or the physically developed exception, which is separate criteria separate and apart from a reasons exception. Mm -hmm. And so really these don't interact in any meaningful way as far as our, our hearing today is concerned, except that it provides some context as to why they're coming in with arguably a more difficult application um, when, uh, it, when really in a perfect world they'd be applying under the easier path. It's just, you know, we brought that up because of the context. Now, uh, as far as standing goes, there's really no way for anybody else to interject themselves in this process and argue that they should have applied for a different procedure. It just doesn't necessarily, or the, that, that argument wouldn't work because under state law, they're allowed to apply for whatever they feel like gives them the best opportunity to, to succeed. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. I'm not sure if it's That's a little fuzzy, point. but it helps. Sure. All right, any more questions or clarification by the commissioners? All right, we'll open the public hearing portion and we'll first hear from the applicant who will have up to 20 minutes. I'm Art Blumenkron, and I'm the current owner of Gobi Walnut. And I guess I'm a little confused in one way. Um, I understand that um, from Martha that the staff is rejecting, but the vote was a unanimous approval. So, planning commission. I, you know, I don't know if there. I don't understand. I guess the difference between staff and the and the vote. Or you're talking about the planning commission. I yes. Take it. Well, they're certainly separate entities. Remember, the Planning Commission is an advisory body to this board. Okay. And, and so they gather the information, give their recommendation, and they did give, did give a recommendation subject to a couple of things. But uh, the staff is totally independent, and we kind of like it that way, actually. Okay. All right. Okay. So I guess uh, what, I, uh, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about um, Gobi, our, our history and our growth, which explains why, you know, why we need to, to move into another location for that part of our business. But the company was started in 1975 by Dr. Gary Gobi, um, who is a uh, physician and lived out on six acres in Albany and had a hobby of making um, uh, antique reproduction muzzle-loading guns and found that, uh, uh, that um, rifles You've probably seen them in some of the uh, some of the movies and whatever. You know they're six feet long, and mm -hmm. they, you know they have to pour the powder in separately. And so he he found that there were uh, these big walnut trees that were dying um, 
in our area and didn't know at the time it was a twig beetle or a thousand canker disease that's been killing them. And uh, so he, was, he would start taking these trees and turning them into muzzleloader blanks for hobbyists who were making these. And from there, it developed into, wow, well, there's a lot of demand for fine walnut furniture and uh, musical tone woods and all different kinds of things. <coughs> so the business grew really slowly. Um, and then Gary decided to retire about nine years ago. And I had been in manufacturing for quite a while um, here in Oregon and decided that this was a great business and purchased the business from Gary and moved it up to Northwest Portland, so it would be closer to where I lived. For six months, I commuted down to Albany from Portland. That was not fun. And so that made for a lot of 12-hour days, going down there, working, coming back. So we moved to, to Portland, and at that point, there were just two employees, myself and one other. And um, once we got into Portland and in the heavy industrial zoning, um, we found an old site that was kind of a close to a brownfield site that we rehabbed and thought that would be enough room for what we were doing. And uh, lo and behold, it started growing a lot quicker than I had anticipated. And we started adding employees, and we started needing more room. And we put in sawmills, and we put in kilns. Uh, we found that if we sold the wood just air dried, you, get, you can um, be selling wood along with powder post beetles, and you get a lot of little tiny holes mm -hmm. after you make something in in your furniture or floor. So we put in drying kilns, which took more space. And then we needed a, a place for people to see the wood, and so that took more space. And so then our um, sawmills, were, which are both electric, because we didn't want the noise and the pollution from uh, diesel sawmills, which are in a small wood business that's typically you do either electric or diesel. So we voted for electric. Um, you know. We have a narrow strip along Highway 30, so we had to put the sawmills down at one end. And what's happened now is we've grown to uh, 12 to 14 employees um, and run the sawmills, you know, constantly five days a week, um, eight hours a day. That uh, trucks coming in um, and customers coming in the same gate and moving the logs around causes quite a bit of danger down at that end, right off Highway 30. There's no left turn lane off of Highway 30 into our site, so they have to go down, turn around, and come back. And that's hard with a, you know, 40-foot, yeah, semi-truck. Um, so it's essentially become, uh, you know, necessary for us to move to a larger location for that part of our business. And then we, we decided, well, we started looking around, and it was so expensive, um, you know, multiple million-dollar sites were all we could find in the in the Portland area, especially in the Northwest Industrial, which is getting squeezed out now with the Pearl District and all the development keeps moving down and property keeps going up and up. So we decided we didn't have to have the air drying, which takes an inch, uh, every inch of thickness takes a year to air dry in walnut and white oak. So for example, if you have one inch thick for flooring, you can cut it in the next year, you can put it in the kiln and dry it. But if you have two inch thick material, which you'd use for musical instrument billets, or three inch thick, which you'd use for leg stock and things like that, it, it has to sit for three years. So, and it takes a lot of space, and you can only stack it so high. Um, so we ran, out of, we ran out of room to store all the wood that we needed to supply our customers, because it takes a long time to dry the wood, kind of like being in the wine business, where you have to store your grapes and you store, store the wine in casks and you need a lot of room. It's the same kind of thing, but it, it's, once you put the wood out there, it just sits. So it's not labor intensive. You just need the space and you can't afford to pay a lot for that space because nothing is really happening other than water evaporating from the wood. So we found this site and it was perfect. It had um, gravel down already. It had a fence yard for security. It had buildings that we could put the sawmill in. And the price was right. We, could, we looked at so many other places and couldn't find anything we could afford um, for the size business we were that you know, gave us the space that we needed. Um, the other nice part about this is that there is agricultural land down below where we can plant um, you know, uh, 
twig beetle and thousand canker resistant walnut that uh, people have been developing. I know Oregon State has been working on this issue. Um, it's the whole Western United States that's being affected from this twig beetle. So, you know, in another so many years, walnut, maybe another 20 years, we may have a lot harder time even finding walnut. We've been developing into other types of wood as well, oak, maple, madrone, myrtle. Um, all of our wood is urban salvage and hazard wood. Um, like when the state hospital came down and they removed trees, um, we, we ended up taking that wood and cutting it into slabs. And we try and keep track of what logs go into which slabs because a lot of times people want to know the story behind their, big, their, tab their conference table or their dining room table. And it's funny, Oregon is really not known for walnut, but we have uh, walnut in most of the major museums around the world that came from, from Oregon because of our business. And a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, high, really high-end furniture manufacturers across the country realize how beautiful this wood is and they're buying Oregon product. Um, for example, uh, there's a company in New York called BDW, and I was having a conversation with him one day. He's from, he, he's from Oregon. He went to uh, University of Oregon, went to New York, and became super successful. So um, he was telling me that Bono has one of our tables from U2. Beyonce has a table from our slabs. I mean, it's, uh, it's really um, amazing to find out where some of this stuff ends up going. Um, in fact, right now we're doing one of the uh, large law firms downtown is putting in a 10-floor office, and uh, all the white oak for the flooring and for the tables and everything is coming from salvage and hazard wood from us. Um, we think, you know, Clackamas County is a great place for us to do business, and the locations <coughs> is perfect because a lot of our, most of our logs, 80% when we did a study, come from the Willamette Valley within a short distance. Um, in fact, right up the road, the Barlow House, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. There were a bunch of walnut trees in the front. Oh, you, you, we utilized them. Yeah, we ended up utilizing those. They were all dying. They had that um, thousand canker disease, and we ended up with those, those logs and made good use of them. So, um, you know, we, it just, it makes a lot of common sense. That site hasn't been an agricultural site up above there since 1947. It's been an industrial use. And we're having to take the circuitous route um, because of some things that I don't really understand, I guess, that, that happened with irrevocably was that, yeah, committed or physically developed. Um, and I thought, wow, our business fits in perfectly with this site. So that's what... We've been at this, what, over a year now, John? Year and a half. <laughs> year and a half, and the, the bank that owns it has been really patient. We keep getting extensions to, mm -hmm. you know, to keep, keep going at this. And uh, if, if there were other sites available to us that we could afford or that, uh, that the business could move into, um, you know, we would have done that instead of spending a year and a half of, you know, time and effort chasing after this, but it, the site just really makes sense for us. Okay, um, you just heard from Art Blumenkron, the owner uh, of Groby Walnut. My name is John Brosi. I'm the planning consultant. Uh, my uh, uh, business address is in uh, downtown Salem, and I've been representing uh, Gobi. Uh, uh, just briefly, the uh, we submitted this at the end, this ap original application under different uh, exception rules um, uh, at the very end of uh, September. And then in November, the uh, Ooten versus Clackamas County decision came down. <coughs> um, uh, staff uh, and, uh, and us discussed uh, the ramifications of that. We had hearings already scheduled before Planning Commission in February and the Board of Commissioners in March. Um, but when it was, it was obvious that uh, the uh, that the Uten decision uh, wiped out uh, uh, 
two out of the three ways of doing uh, goal three exceptions, including the one that we chose. Uh, the other one would have been fairly easy to say, uh, shouldn't say easy, but uh, fairly straightforward uh, also. Uh, um, we, we, backed, we backed away uh, and, uh, and decided to uh, resubmit under the reasons exception. Now, the <coughs> it's good that things, uh, I think Martha mentioned that, uh, that the, uh, the appellants uh, on the Uten thing took it all the way up as far as they could go. They didn't go to the state Supreme Court, but they went to the Court of Appeals twice, uh, the small panel, and then the end bank. Court of Appeals and Court of Appeals upheld uh, Luba. The other, uh, so we're on that track, we're left with uh, rulemaking. Uh, it's which is is uh, some discussion before the commission, the LCDC commission is going to happen sometime, probably early uh, next calendar year. But that uh, that is is kind of imprecise and we knew that if we submitted an application that at some point we would actually get a, a, a hearing before the Board of Commissioners and it turns out we're way ahead of, uh, of that other process as much as we would love to get in a, a, a time machine and, and go forward uh, we were not able to do that obviously um, now um, so uh, it's a I think uh, important for the board to know that even though there wasn't any uh, opposition testimony, that planning commission spent a good deal of time uh, asking questions, making comments. Each one of the seven commissioners participated uh, in the hearing in uh, uh, September 28th. And they came, to, I think it's not insignificant uh, that they came to the conclusion seven to nothing to support our application. Um, they wanted uh, to see two additional things, which as Martha mentioned, we submitted, the ESEE analysis, and then also some information about noise. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss uh, the noise thing just briefly. Uh, uh, we, we took uh, uh, decibel uh, readings from uh, four different locations at the existing <coughs> business. The existing business, it's kind of hard from a, from a noise uh, science standpoint because the the, the uh, saws are only about 100 feet away from Highway uh, 30, St. Helens Road, which is, a, as most of you know, is a very busy industrial uh, highway. Um, and uh, the readings were not different than the ambient noise coming off the highway. And we should realize, also should realize that the, what, the, what, it happen, what is proposed to happen or to, to be relocated on this site in Clackamas County are two uh, uh, single uh, saw uh, uh, blade uh, saw mills. One is actually small enough that you could uh, trailer behind a pickup truck. Um, and they only operate when uh, this salvage wood uh, comes to the site. Um, and uh, so the, the decibel level readings that you have there show that the, the sound is relatively insignificant. Now this is going to be a quieter site because Highway 99E at this location, although it's a big, wide uh, state highway, it doesn't carry, except during rush hour, uh, uh, anything like the at least the heavy, noisy truck traffic you have in northwest Portland. But, can I add something? Go ahead. Yes. You can easily hold a conversation standing by one of the mills, yeah. which is not the same as a, you know, one of the large industrial sawmills. Right. So, uh, so that's, uh, this, I think uh, the Planning Commission uh, was curious about that. Uh, and we so we submitted that they they said you know provide this before the board of commissioners meeting at least and then the, also the ESEE analysis uh, we provided as well um, and the reason why we wait, waited till the end for that is it, it's it is such almost was such a, almost ridiculous to think that uh, somehow uh, what you have to do in that analysis is compare the impacts of locating here which requires a goal three exception with locating on a farm property, uh, an EFU property somewhere in the vicinity. And the impacts, uh, uh, environmental, uh, economic, social, and energy impacts are, you know, there's, there's just no comparison. What you're moving into is a, is a site that, as Martha mentioned and Art mentioned, has been used for not, not been used for agriculture since 1947. There's, there's close to 9,500 square feet of building here, 
uh, that is usable. Now, some of, uh, some of it's more usable than others, but there's a, there's a large building right in the middle of the site that uh, is large enough for uh, these, uh, the two mills that are in two different uh, buildings now in uh, Northwest Portland to be located within the building. Now, in Northwest Portland, uh, uh, there's actually sheds that are open on one side. Uh, in here, they'll be in enclosed buildings and, and actually uh, 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 they're metal buildings, but they, they have, uh, they'll be insulated. They are insulated. So uh, uh, it, this site is so unique, um, and we have a preponderance of common sense going for us. We always have in this situation. We think that uh, uh, we will be able to uh, assist, assist staff and write uh, uh, adequate findings for your uh, ordinance approving this, um, uh, uh, despite the staff's uh, uh, objection, at least initially, to the the reasons reasons exception. Um, it's it's not insignificant. I think y you as commissioners know from other land use cases that are much more controversial that. It's not insignificant that your Department of, Lands of Transportation and ODOT have absolutely no opposition to this. We provided a very extensive traffic, traffic impact analysis, which was required by the process, and there's no opposition. This is a, a very safe, uh, particularly compared to the location in Northwest Portland, very safe location on Highway 99E to move uh, trucks on and off the, this property. Lots of sight distance deceleration lanes, right-hand turn lanes, the whole, you know, everything you need uh, for this particular site. Again, it's a site that it really fits this uh, like a glove. The, uh, the site, uh, it, it's not insignificant that no state agencies or other special interest groups have weighed in in opposition to this, including Department of Land Conservation and Development. Um, it's sig in not uh, insignificant, there's no property owner opposition to this at all. So uh, that, that makes it fairly unique, I think, from your uh, other experiences. Um, uh, I just want to rem remind the, the board that uh, the count the, this meets the county conference plan policies, the county zone change approval criteria, and all aspects of the state goals and policies with, uh, with uh, you know, the modification of the reasons exception, which uh, which we have addressed and we did uh, uh, bolster actually after the Planning Commission uh, agreed with us uh, seven to nothing. Um, even the alternative analysis, which is the last thing the staff uh, was, was concerned with, I, I believe we'll be able to write you know, adequate uh, findings, uh, bulletproof, uh, maybe not be the right word, but certainly adequate findings. Uh, remember, that what we had to go through, through in the reasons exceptions, we had to analyze all the available property. With the, first, the first study area we had was all of that not unincorporated area outside of the city canby. City canby doesn't go, city limits line doesn't go across the Molala River. So all that industrial area uh, on that side of canby was analyzed. Was, we looked at those properties. There wasn't one property that was available. It's a good thing for the, the economy's back. And there, is, there are no vacancies. Uh, it, there were no vacancies when we did the study in April. Um, we, there were no vacancies in the city of Aurora uh, uh, either. Uh, and then when, when staff uh, said, well, what about Wilsonville? <coughs> and, uh, and what about uh, inside the city limits of Camby? That's, that's when we got into the analysis, which you have. Uh, of those sites in Wilsonville, and it, what it boils down to really is what Art was saying, which is that this is a unique need. We can't afford, we don't need, it's not appropriate from a city uh, policy standpoint to have a use that, ha that has so few employees, uh, let alone, uh, the, you know, it's just a, it's just a bad match and the, the rest of the city can be industrial areas and the city of Wilsonville, the new city in Wilsonville industrial areas because those are fully improved sites with water, sanitary sewer, you know, big road improvements, and they're expecting lots and lots of employees to go there. We just don't have that kind of need. So uh, I, the, the alternative analysis I think we, we addressed uh, 
and it, it was rigorous, but we addressed it. And uh, we uh, probably would be happy to answer any questions you might have, but that concludes our presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. Smith. You said something that I'm sure I, I want clarification on it. You said you will write adequate findings to support what? Well, the, pro the process is. And you haven't written those yet? No, we have. But the, there's that after, after, if the board chooses to approve this, then, there's a, uh, then, it, then the uh, ordinance comes back to you. And as I understand it in Clackamas County, um, the, the, the county council and the, and the planning staff are asking us to do a lot of that writing. I'm just saying that it, well, it's, it's all part is, of the record. My question is, why didn't you do it now? We, have, we did, and it's in the record. Uh, it, it's, a, it's probably just a, uh, it's a nomenclature thing. It's, some, it's an ordinance that can't be uh, uh, written until after this hearing. Okay. Um, the alternative exceptions. You said there are no sites available around the Canby area. Right. Did you look at other small towns, or does that apply to the alternatives, Martha? Oh, it, I guess it would depend on what other small towns you were talking about. I, they looked at things in the general area that um, the business wanted to locate to be closer to a lot of its suppliers and some of its employees. So looking, for example, like out in Boring isn't, isn't reasonable to expect for an alternatives analysis. Okay, so going far out, miles away, does not, that's not part of the alternatives criteria that we would no. use. Okay, good. Well, I think they've satisfied the alternatives. And need, I don't even understand. Uh, Clackamas County needs jobs. We need this type of, this is very well suited for this um, uh, type of business. The fact that Luba is totally sideways, the fact that our land use planning in this state is totally upside down, that we can't even use common sense when we cite businesses is not my problem as a Board of County Commissioner member. My, uh, how I look at my job as being is to, um, going back to our strategic plan, we want jobs, we want businesses. And the fact that we have an overarching uh, higher government that can't see uh, what our other governments at this level are doing, you know, is just something that we're gonna have to fight. Now, if, if you get approval here, you're going to have to do a much better job in presenting the needs and alternatives than you did today. And secondly, I don't like being submitted information at the last minute. That is, I tell you, that would be a reason for me to, to vote no on this right now. I think you've had enough opportunity to do your due diligence and make your presentations a week before and getting information to commissioners. And I hope if you ever come back to us again, this doesn't happen. If you ever represent somebody, you do not have last minute things. This was this is like four and five pages that um, I'm supposed to read and make a decision while everybody else around me is talking. I take this type of hearing very seriously. And I like to review the information. And I like to compare it to this argument over here. I haven't had opportunity to do that because this was late. Just let you know. Commissioner Bernard. Well, mine are somewhat similar to what Commissioner Smith said. Um, um, I happen to think land use laws are important, but common sense <coughs> does not always apply. <laughs> this piece, which I have driven by many times, is obviously not being used for farmland. It has structures on it, it's paved. Converting it back to farmland would be very expensive. There'd be a lot of waste and it just makes sense to do this. So uh, I don't think in a lot of ways it does meet the, many of the criteria required. Uh, and it's one of those situations where I reach for uh, to meet the requirements of the law. But look out in the audience. There's not a lot of people here to say, we don't think we sh you should be doing this. Uh, if somebody was here, I would have listened intently to what they said. But 
but there aren't, they aren't here. And uh, this area is mostly rural industrial already. So um, I, I'm just, I'm leaning towards approving this. The Planning Commission, uh, who are generally a little more um, strict. strict than we are, approved it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm ready to move forward on this after you ask the public if they want to testify. You know, this, we're going to go through one more commissioner, at least one more com commissioner question. Commissioner Schrader. So I have been paying attention to what you've been saying, but what I did was look you up on the internet. Your products are beautiful. Uh, they're well made. We have a, um, an agricultural investment plan in this county that in includes the kinds of production that you are working with. So I would strongly suggest at some point you have an opportunity to talk to uh, our economic development team here in Clackamas County because they will put you in contact with other numerous folks that can help this business grow and expand. Um, here's how I see this. It is staff's job to give us a technical analysis, but one of the reasons why they have a process with an advisory body and coming to the commission is, in the end, there's the leeway for us to make a judgment call one way or the other, and uh, I'm ready to approve this when uh, if we can move forward. I think it's exactly what fits into what we want to see happening in this county. Um, I think, the product, as I said, the products are beautiful. Um, we're working right now on huge projects having to do with cross-laminated timber and wood products. I don't know if you're aware of that. I, am, yeah. I don't even know if you really fit into that. Uh, but this is exactly the kind of artisan uh, company that we want to see here in this county, and we want to see it grow and succeed. So um, I guess, Commissioner, uh, let's go through the appropriate process so we can uh, move ahead, get this approved, and let this business uh, succeed and flourish in this county. Products are outstanding. Oh, I encourage you. anybody to take a look at the website to see the um, things that are being produced and made. And as I said, please realize staff has to give us a technical analysis based on based on what the land use laws are. But the reason you're before us because there is leeway for us, in my opinion, to to use common sense and you know say, well, good. Good job. So, where are we, commissioners? Where are we? In We're the process? To, well, I've got a process here. I'll go. I'll go through it. So, um, um, the applicant has presented, and there's been some questions. Uh, I am supposed to ask if there's anybody else at all, whether they're elected officials or interested parties or anybody in this room that would like to testify. All right. I'm going to close the public hearing, and uh, I have a couple comments before a motion is made. I'm concerned that that you have uh, electric sawmills, and that, that sounds great. But I don't think there's any um, condition uh, as proposed that would prevent you from going to diesel ones. And I, diesel, diesels are very noisy. Uh, so um, I w Martha, what do you, you have something to say about that? So if I could <clears throat> just jump in. Uh, because this, is, this would be approved under a reasons exception, it is limited only to the uses that you're approving. Um, so the way that I had um, listed it in your staff report on page four, number three, it specifically um, talks about the installation of two electric sawmills. So one could argue, I think, that um, it really includes only the electric sawmills. Okay, that sounds good. Can I, am I allowed to say anything? Eh, go ahead. I, I even ha I, I am going to economic development after this, um, and I have this wild idea of we're going to cover our um, wood out there drying with tea sheds, and I'd like to put solar on top of the the tea sheds, and then be able to be like the first sawmill in the country that's running completely off solar energy, not even using electricity from the That'd from you know cool. coal or anything else. We're, we're very concerned with the environment. If you can get three-phase power from solar, let me know how you do that. Commissioner Savas. Well, I, I just want to go just over. I don't want to get hung up on the technicality, and it sounds like my colleagues don't want to get hung up on that technicality also. I'm just kind of asking uh, our legal counsel, uh, Mr. Boderman, um, uh, if he anticipates any consequences either 
on this particular thing or in the future? Um, is this fall under a That's precedent right. setting, so on, so on? So can you give, give me your insight sure. on that? Uh, with regards to this specific application, uh, it falls under normal land use appeal rules. And so if there's no appeal within 21 days of the final decision, which is adoption of the board order, um, then anybody's precluded, really, from, from appealing this matter further. Uh, your point's well taken that it may uh, create some precedent in the future that could be used as evidence in future land use actions that if a similar use or, or a similar situation arises, um, that may be grounds for, or it may be evidence that could be used in, in future appeals. Okay. Would, would, that be, um, would that be limited to the reasons element or would it be some of the rationale and comments made by the five of us? Uh, primarily in the context of the reasons, I'd imagine. I, it, we, we've heard odd things in hearings, as you know, and so I mean, it certainly doesn't preclude anybody from coming up and, and you know, dragging out a transcript of this hearing and saying, look, you, know, you, you applied this logic in this scenario, so you should apply the same logic in another scenario, or you said this in one context and, and wrapping it around and, and you know, using it in another context. So uh, hard to know what people will argue in the future, but certainly precedent as far as a, um, a reasons exception goes, I could see a situation where that might apply. Okay, the uh, applicant has indicated that he indeed submitted the reasons for that, and, and is it a matter of form or is it a matter of meeting the threshold that you feel that it was not met? Was it the form or was it the threshold? Um, in my mind, it was the threshold. And I guess the, you know, the term adequate, it's just where we disagree. And the applicant feels they've provided adequate information and I analyzed it and um, assert that they did not. Yeah, and I, I think the way this all came about, again, citing the, the house paving uh, issue in a year's time, that this is, um, uh, obviously a, a complication of that. So um, I'm, again, I don't want to get hung up on technicalities, and I, I, I do want to just cite that I, I am a little bit concerned about that, but uh, we are interested in, in jobs. We are interested in small business succeeding. Um, and uh, so I, I, I saw uh, the some of your product as well. So I want to just concur with a lot of the comments that were made here, you know, in the positive as far as your business operation, your product. So, so um, thank you for considering Clackamas County. Commissioner Schrader. So I just wanted to clarify something. You know, again, this is this is one opinion, but my understanding is because of the Hal's uh, appeal that there are new rules that are being looked at and that we are involved in that rulemaking process yes. as a county. So there is an issue with, I guess, I guess my point is that, <clears throat> that hopefully it will, it, the rule will be looked at and changed so we're not dealing with this kind of a hurdle or what is perceived as a technical hurdle perceived as a technical hurdle at this point. I mean, we don't um, know what's going to happen. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that. I mean, the, the, the reasons exception, the goal exception processes are so case by case, I guess you can say that, you know, you have to look at the, uh, the, the individual properties. And this one, you know, in staff's opinion, and I think in the applicant's opinion, you know, originally fits better under a different exception, but for uh, this unfortunate interpretation that, uh, that, that the courts made. I mean, it, and which is being fixed by LCDC or is planned to be fixed by LCDC here in a couple months. Timing considerations you know, aren't necessarily favorable uh, to allow that to happen. Um, but like to, I just want to make sure that's part of the record, that there is a technical fix, fixing it. process. And yep. we need to be aware of that. Commissioner Bernard. <laughs> and I think that's part of the decision. You know, I voted no on HALS. This is not HALS. This is... In, area that is industrialized, mm -hmm. no, the nearest neighbor are, are most likely rental homes, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it's really on a major road. So uh, for me, it's not a house issue. The house issue is a problem in that may be fixed in legislation, but this, this is more of a common sense, logical decision we're making today, having dri dri uh, driving by that place, 
about once a week. Uh, it's, um, it's obviously uh, a good decision on our part. To, I'd love to see this whole area rezoned, in, uh, rural, industrial, and um, hope maybe some of those folks will get together and do exactly that. All right, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I move to approve ZO294-15-CP and ZO295-15-ZAP as proposed by the applicant with the following modifications. Number one, that the comprehensive plan map and zoning map change only apply to the portion of the property as illustrated in Exhibit 7 containing approximately five acres. Second. Second. Yeah, right, you're fighting for it, huh? Uh, Commissioner Smith with the motion, Commissioner Schrader with the second. You know, um, one of the things that uh, that I have been in my life is very young. I, I uh, went through the journeyman program uh, to become a car carpenter, uh, certification of a journeyman carper carpenter in the state of Oregon. And one of the great things I got to do was supervise 32 um, Finnish carpenters when we did Columbia Edgewater Country Club, really a lot of red oak there. Then as it, be as it became a, a broker, always loving, a real estate broker, always loving wood, uh, up to my surprise, I was selling a 25-acre parcel up on Bull Mountain and there was these dead, dying walnut trees. And this gentleman approached me, uh, coming up from California with a backhoe on, on the back of his trailer. And he said, I want to buy those walnut trees. I said, well, why do you need a backhoe? He says, I want to buy the root ball. That, that's what he wanted. He made huge tabletops from the root balls. I thought it was fascinating stuff. Also, I got to do uh, matched paneling, uh, you know, fantastic, beautiful veneer in elevators downtown Portland and so, at some of my jobs. So I really love wood. And I really like what you're doing with wood and the fact that you're recapturing a lot of wood. You know, one of the <coughs> fascinating things I've seen on TV is those guys that go down in the rivers and pick up that old wood that's sitting down at the bottom of that, and some of it's hundreds of years old, extremely good and evidently instrument making. But uh, I intend to vote for this because I do believe the land use process in Oregon is screwed up, messed up bad. I mean, for since 1970, we've bragged about this great system we've got, and you would think, after all this time, that the other 49 states would emulate this fantastic system. It's cumbersome, it sends businesses away, it's oppressive, and it's very costly to do anything as far as a change. Nothing will change in this area, although perhaps it should, like Commissioner Bernard said, towards an industrial use, because it's, it's precious EFU. We don't dare touch and we can't touch according to the state of Oregon. So I've got no problem with this usage. I, I was telling somebody earlier that in my younger days, that one of the things they had on this property was um, they stored and rented those huge spotlights. I mean, these things were, if you remember, the, when I was growing up, they, when they were doing a grand opening or something, there was no internet, there was nobody's calling you, a few yeah. ads in the paper, they'd run these, you'd see these five spotlights going back and forth and back and forth. I always thought there was an interesting storage place for that. They operated their business out of the same property. So I've certainly been watching it for a period of decades. And uh, this sounds like a very compatible use. And uh, I think you're going to be a great neighbor and a great businessman for uh, Clackamas County. C Commissioner Smith, did you have your zone again? I have, yes, yes. I just have one final comment. Um, whereas we probably will approve this unanimously, I want to caution you. Please pay attention to Martha Fritzi. When she says denial for a reason, there's a reason. Um, I, and I will reiterate again, if this goes to loop and fails and comes back, it's not because of the Goldby Walnut business. I would say, Mr. Brody, it, the responsibility falls on your shoulder to make better arguments on the um, exceptions. Thank you very much. All right, staff, any more comments? All right, are we ready for the question? Kevin. Hi, Commissioner Savas. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Smith. Aye. Commissioner Bernard? Aye. Chair Ludlow? Aye. Passes 5-0. Now, I've got to wrap this up, so bear with me. Uh, now that the amendments have, have been approved, I will direct staff to draft an ordinance reflecting today's decision and include it on the agenda for this board's adoption at a future business meeting. Now, there being no further business before us at this hearing this day, this meeting is adjourned.